Hi folks, Steve Grono, uh, just collector and uh, fan of uh, maritime history. I uh, just in here in the little museum collection I've got, I want to point out a couple of my favorite items to you. Uh, first of all, just right here in front of me, this is a collection of AGA acetylene powered buoy lights. Now AGA, uh, you know, uh, patented by Dahlin uh, back in uh, 1905. This is the first example of acetylene powered buoy lights, aids to navigation. Uh, right here, there's uh, multiple examples, probably most of the examples that AGA ever built uh, over their uh, lifetime. They're still in business, by the way. Uh, by the way, what we have here is a 200 millimeter buoy light, another 200 millimeter buoy light, a 140 millimeter buoy light right there, very rare piece, and this one, another 140. This is a 500 millimeter buoy light right here with a multiple burner, four different... Um, burners in this, four mantles, so that as one burns out, there's a teak shim that the flame burns through, which trips a clockwork, which rotates the burned out mantle out of place and a new mantle in place so the acetylene can burn that. And this uh, awesome aid to navigation can stay working. This is a sun valve. The sun valve is an incredible invention. Gustav Dahlin, of course, invented it. Um, this is the world's first photocell, and what it does is it senses daylight. So what happened in, uh, in, this, in this era, 1900, 1910, is that Dowland perfected this method, and what would happen is in, upon daybreak, this would uh, have enough power to shut the flow of gas off to the burner in the uh, lamp. So that instead of wasting gas during daylight hours with the flash characteristic of the uh, buoy light, it would shut off and rest during daylight. And then at night, the sun valve would say, hey, it's dark. And then it would open the flow of gas. There's a micro pilot within there that stays lit all the time. And then it would ignite. And it would, it would run the flash characteristic all night long. Incredible savings to the various lighthouse services across the world because they were uh, spending most of their budget on maintaining aids and navigation. They required a lot of service, a lot of maintenance. When Gustav Dahlin invented the sun valve, it, it revolutionized. It cut everything in half. Uh, essentially making it uh, f affordable for more aids to navigation around the world. This is a tribute to AGA and Dahlin here. It's a collection. 300 millimeter, 375 millimeter mantle changer, 500 millimeter mantle changer, 200 millimeter, that's the workhorse, uh, and the other smaller examples right here with the actual burner right here. This is the a little uh, patent plate from uh, AGA, and that's a uh, acetylene burner from the time frame that we're talking about. So anyway, uh, that's just the start of it. Over here, one of my favorite pieces, this is a third order, uh, sorry, second order. This is a second order lens panel, one of four sections. Uh, it would have been, uh, we recovered this from the island of Bahrain in the Persian Gulf. Uh, it's a rotating flasher, as you can see, lower cat adapterix, center bullseye, upper cats. We're so fortunate to find even one section of the original four here. We do have a few other miscellaneous pieces from this lens, but we have one example of that. It was on duty somewhere in the Persian Gulf. We don't know where it was stationed, but there it is, a wonderful example of a second order flashing rotating lens panel. This one, probably one of my other favorites, very unusual, one of a kind, Archer Point Light. Um, this is an amazing piece. It's the Archer Point Lighthouse, it's called a sector lens. It's a thousand millimeter inside diameter. Reflectors on this side, there's a bullseye on that side. And what this lens does is it's situated in the lighthouse in such a way that it casts a light directly on the obstruction, the reef, the rock, whatever it was from the lighthouse. It would cast a beam of light directly on that item so that the mariner could see it. That's the only one of its kind I know of in the world that still exists. Pretty cool. Uh, these are various clockwork bell ringers, fog bell, fog signal, all of it is attributed to the sound of warning mariners of danger. And uh, I'm not going to get into all those, but this one is my favorite right here. It's a, it's a, um, this is an incredible game well made by this gentleman right here, John Gamewell. He was a, just an amazing piece of lighthouse history. His principal occupation was to build these uh, bell strikers for the uh, most of the fire stations around the United States. Here's his patent drawing right here, the Gamewell uh, fog bell striking apparatus. These are the patent drawings, really cool stuff. He um, 
built them originally for fire stations and then a lighthouse service contracted with him so that he created them for an application where they would actually strike a fog bell and warn mariners of impending danger during periods of fog. Now this bell, uh, I've created this little display that is actually functioning and working to show how it works with the hammer and the clockwork and the, the weights that would run down the tower, uh, the fog bell tower. The bell that I'm ringing is actually a Trinity House bell cast um, in 1963. Uh, this would have been used in England. It's a 200 pound bell. Uh, and I've powder coated it, cleaned it up a little bit, so it's nice. So anyway, that operates and rings that bell. So I can just show how the bell striker worked. Pretty cool uh, little example. This is a, a Stevens uh, bell striker here. This is a fog whistle that would be you know pulled during periods of fog. A couple of historic drawings uh, from the uh, Lighthouse Depot in 1890, where they were working on fog bells. This is, this is 1905. Uh, here's another one where they're working on a, uh, this is obviously a bell striker mechanism they're working on at the lamp shop in Chelsea, uh, Massachusetts in 1905. Here is a steam Ingersoll Rand. This would, would compress air, which was stored in 1,000 gallon um, uh, airtight cylinders that would fire, of course, the fog uh, sirens, the fog whistles. Here's an example of a fog trumpet. Uh, from the Ambrose, there it is pointing upward. Pretty cool stuff. Anyway, just a little tribute to the uh, that portion of Lighthouse history. And then um, this little section over here, uh, just really quickly, this is um, illuminance. This is the lamp that would sit in the middle of the lens and create, the, of course, the illuminant. And most of these originally were oil-fueled. Uh, um, these are examples of European. This is Chance Brothers. Most of this type of a burner would have been used in a fourth-order lens in England and Europe, same thing here. This is used in England and Europe. In the United States, this is a fourth order. Uh, um, this is a uh, Winslow Lewis fourth order. Actually, this is Funk Heap. And Funk Heap was the brand that manufactured this for the lighthouse service. So that what they could do is they could rotate the vent ball and create the flame up, down, and get it just right. Capillary lamp, it would just draw the fuel up. Pure kerosene, of course it was many fuels used in this in the early days. Here's an example of some of the fuels right here uh, that the Lighthouse Service used. And you, as you can see, the, the, the experiment with olive oil, linseed oil, lard oil, camphene oil. They used whale oil, which was very popular, obviously, from the whaling days in colza. Uh, all of these were used in addition to, finally, they came up with kerosene, which was the most successful and the brightest flame and easiest to maintain. So this is just a little collection of the various burners. This is an arc lamp, one of a kind. I've never seen another one in a museum. It would, it would burn an arc rod with a dynamo inside the lens to create a bright light here. Uh, and it was working on a, on a clockwork here to keep these arc rods moving together as they burned away. An incredible, uh, very rare piece of work, about 1890 on that one. So anyway, that's just a little bit. Here's a nice, beautiful fourth order fixed lens sector. Um, does have a beautiful reflector um, right here. This is a silvered reflector, which would actually capture the light escaping. Um, I'll try to show you. Here's the acetylene burner inside the lens. That would part originally, this would be of course, powered by one of these fourth order lamps. This is what would have been inside it originally right here. Later, as technology advanced, we updated it to the acetylene gas. And then of course, finally, it was powered by electricity, but um, this is a fixed lens. The burner would create a flash characteristic in order to um, uh, give the mariners a uh, chartable, identifiable landmark so they knew what they were looking at. And this piece would fit right up in here to re help to amplify the light being reflected forward through the catadroptric. So that's just a panel removable. Um, the part that would be seaward would be over here. I'll just kind of walk around so you can see that. That's the part of the lens that you would see from seaward. And as that acetylene burner would flash, one, two, three, and then quiet for 10, one, two, three, quiet for 10, three FL10, three flashes every 10 seconds. And what that would do is it would tell the mariner what he was seeing on the chart. Uh, very incredible. That's a, all of the aids of navigation worldwide are still based that way. 
based on the flash characteristic. This is an early Winslow Lewis lens. This one came as one of the very first attempts beyond, you know, uh, just logs burning at the top of a tower. This was one of the very first attempts to magnify the light uh, from a lighthouse or an aid to navigation. It's extremely rare. Um, we don't know of uh, only one or two others in museums around the country, but it's a Winslow Lewis lamp, very clearly green glass, uh, ind indicative of the formulas of the day that were used to produce that lens. The Mariners actually complained about it so badly that they said, take it out and leave it the way it was before. <laughs> so it didn't work very well. An early AGA acetylene sun valve right there. And this is an IOV lamp, incandescent oil vapor, which I'll show you in a minute, a few others that we have in the collection. So anyway, uh, let's just, oh, while I'm here, uh, what you're looking at right here is a range. Um, the upper lens, way up there, if you can see it, I'll try to zoom in on it. I don't know if that's in focus or not, but that's a real early 1880s Chance Brothers range light, approximately fourth order. You can see the center bullseye. Below it right here, we have a later 1927 Chance Brothers range light. The Mariner would literally try to line up both of these so they were directly atop one another, and that way he knew he was in the channel as he approached. Now, if he got over this way, as you can see, the top one is moving out of sync with the bottom one, and that would tell the Mariner, whoa, I'm out of the channel, I may run aground, I need to move my vessel to the port so that both of these are lined up, and then he could proceed forward. If he got too far off to port, you can see how they come out of line again. The lower light is to the starboard, that means go starboard, and again, you come over and line them up, and you just keep on proceeding until you get into safe harbor. So that's why we set this little range light up. It's kind of cool. This is the prize of our collection right here. This is a Chance Brothers um, third middle 800 millimeter lens. One of the first lenses we acquired from Australia. It's from the Bailey uh, Islet, uh, Queensland, Australia Lighthouse. Came in a basket. We took it apart, cleaned it up, reconstructed it. it. Took a year or so, and now here it is, magnificent. We found an original cast iron pedestal for it. Here's an original architectural lighthouse drawing showing the 800 millimeter uh, lens and the lantern in the lantern room. Uh, original engineering drawing right there, kind of cool. And that's really one of our favorites. This one is, I won't let this go on too long, but this is, uh, this is one of Chance Brothers' original attempts at the IOV burner. Incandescent, incandescent oil vapor consisted of a tank that would hold compressed air and a tank that would hold kerosene. The keeper would uh, pump this up. It would take a couple of hours to get enough pressure. The desired pressure was 67 PSI in both tanks. And then what the keeper would have to do is he'd have to grab this little alcohol burner, which was filled with about, uh, it would take about 17 minutes to burn out both of these wicks. What he would do is light those, fill it up with alcohol, light those, and he put it right here. And what it would do, it would heat up this Bunsen. This is like a Bunsen burner, if any of you remember from high school what a Bunsen burner is. This is just a tube that goes back and forth uh, above this flame that created by the alcohol burner. The alcohol burner would superheat the tubes, and what the keeper would do is he'd open the valve, allowing the kerosene to flow at a measured rate up through this tube, up into this amazingly hot burner, this tube. As it would pass through the burner, it would vaporize, it would come through a small hole up through this little draft hood, then it would pass up through the burner and flame right here. And right here there would be a mantle like a Coleman lantern, and that mantle would produce 2,000 candle power, which was incredibly bright, far superior to the acetylene burners, far superior to the capillary burners. And this was the preferred illuminant in all the major lights from about 1815 through about 18, or I'm sorry, 1915 through about 1940, when everything became electrified. Uh, there's still one or two of these in existence. One of them is in the Bahamas. I've been to it. It's still working today. Here's a picture of the keeper preparing the IOV lamp for the night. Uh, you can see this is a um, Irish uh, lighthouse keeper, and what he's doing is right here. He's adjusting the uh, flow. Here is the alcohol burner, and here is the IOV lamp, 55 millimeter IOV. As you can see, he's standing inside a first order lens. See the bullseye right here? That's a first order lens. It's nine feet tall, six feet wide, weighs 9,000 pounds. Incredible piece of engineering. Uh, and that is the item that he would have to start up every night and run all night long. 
So anyway, that's a few little highlights from our little uh, goofy collection, and I hope uh, you've enjoyed that. I'll, I'll go into some more life-saving service stuff next time and some more of the lighthouse service, some of the brassware, uh, some of the history of the keepers I'll tell you about, all the items that they used in their daily life is here in this cabinet. There's a zillion things in here to talk about. Uh, you know, don't have time in this video, but we'll we'll get into it in a future video. But uh, I hope anyway, I hope that was entertaining. We owe these uh, ancient folks a debt of gratitude for keeping uh, people sort of safe at sea. And they, I can't tell you the untold lives that aids to navigation have, uh, you know, have saved over the years. So anyway, until next time, Steve Grono uh, signing off. And if anyone wants to come for a tour of the museum, feel free to give me a call, 810-599-5147. Thanks.